Good morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Joe Valentino. It's a privilege to be here today. I'm the campus pastor, and I'm with Pastor Steve Turnbull, who's our senior pastor. He's going to deliver the message today. I also want to just say thank you for those of you who were here last week and helped make last week happen. If you happen to stick around long enough to see the Easter egg hunt, it was an amazing <laughs> sight. All two minutes of it. Um, I think it was like 4,000 eggs and uh, we're, there's a sermon in there somewhere that we'll, we'll deal with a little bit. It was like the best two minutes on television. It was man. incredible. It was, awesome. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. Now that you know who we are, although I forgot my name tag, uh, welcome to worship today. Happy first Sunday of Easter to you. Glad that you're here uh, to celebrate the risen Lord. Uh, we'd love it if you would please let us know that you were here uh, on the Know Your Row pads, those black and blue folders that are in each of your rows. It really does help us stay connected together as a church family and helps us care for you. We're getting to that time of year where we'll be celebrating graduates, and we'd like to celebrate your graduates, whether they're high school graduates, um, post-high uh, school graduates, even post-college graduates. And, but we don't know who all is graduating, and so we need your help to identify them and to celebrate them. Um, on uh, April t uh, 10th will be the last opportunity to get us that name and information, but you can connect us with ualc.org slash stay connected. There's a way to actually let us know um, who your graduates are so we can celebrate them at the end of April. We'll be doing some of that. So. Oh, let's stand and sing this glorious Easter hymn. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, with you we celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection. By the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Congregation, if you'd be seated. Kids, if you would come up for the kids' sermon. Melissa has something for us today.
Good morning. How are you guys today? Good. Okay, I have a little something special for you. Do you guys want to choose one of these? What do these remind you of? Of Easter. We just celebrated Easter. What do you think is in that little egg? Candy? That was a little hesitant of a guess. You're hoping for good intentions on my part, huh? Okay, well, to find out, how, how are we going to do that? How are you going to find out if it's really candy? You have to open it. Can the candy find a way out on its own? No? Are you sure? Could it push its way up through the egg and come out like a little chicken? No, it can't do that. The candy can't do anything. The candy is stuck inside that egg. You have to open it. And when, have you ever heard me use the phrase before that we are stuck in sin? You heard me say that? Sometimes that's hard to understand because we can have good days and we can have bad days and some days we feel really stuck, like I just can't do anything right. And then some days we have great days and we don't think anything's wrong with us. But we're kind of like the stuck little candy. And in reality, we can't get out of that sin that has trapped us. And so what's amazing is that God loves us, and he opens and he pulls us away from that sin that we're stuck in. When Jesus died on the cross and freed us from our sin, he pulled us away from our sin nature. And he said, you have new freedom in me because you belong to me. Because my life and my righteousness is given to you as a free gift through your faith. And what's really amazing, can you enjoy the candy more when it's inside the egg or outside the egg? Of course, when you get to actually eat it. The candy is way better that way. Do you know the next thing that we celebrate as a church after Easter? Do you know what that thing is called? Here in a few weeks, we celebrate something called Pentecost, and we celebrate the day of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell with God's people. And so being free from our sin no longer being stuck in our sin, but free because of Christ, means the Holy Spirit can come and live in us. And it's not just that we're free and we get to float in the air and this candy gets to be outside the egg. It's really that we get to have a relationship with God that's forever and for always and in all things that we do. God promises to come and live in our hearts and then we get to enjoy doing things God's way because of God's spirit working in us. Do you have a favorite toy or a favorite thing that you like to play with at home? What's your favorite thing? Anything? Like a stuffed animal or a doll or maybe playing outside in the backyard? Do you ever have days when it's hard to share something like that that's a favorite? I do. Okay. <laughs> I bet you do too. But God tells us that when his spirit works in us, we're not just free to go and do whatever we want, but we're freed to be able to share what we have and enjoy what we have with other people. That's part of being free in God's family. So you get to enjoy what's inside that egg. Could I give you a couple to maybe share with someone else? Could you take some to your seats? Thank you. Let me pray for these guys, and then we'll move on. Lord, I thank you um, for how you work in our hearts, that you promise us not just freedom from sin, but freedom to continue walking with you and enjoy the good gift of your spirit dwelling us. I pray for even our littlest ones, that we would learn what it looks like to enjoy true freedom that means continuing to give the gift of life with you to those around us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the sixth chapter. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Gospel of the Lord. Please go ahead and be seated. Good morning to all of you. Welcome to worship again this morning. Great to be here with you. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning. Thank you for being here. If we haven't met before, I'm Steve. I'm your senior pastor here at UALC and glad to celebrate the first Sunday after Easter with you. Uh, do you. Do you know the Easter call and response that he is risen? He is risen indeed. That's how we do it. He is risen. He is risen. Alleluia. That is good news. Alleluia. Thank you for doing that with me. Thank you. Uh, it's funny. I think between our campuses, we do that a little bit differently. Better, better sync that up. Uh, it is a joy to be here with you on Easter to celebrate, to remember, to learn the power and grace of the risen and living Lord Jesus who gives joy and freedom to us in all kinds of different areas of our lives. We're starting a series this morning called Free, about the freeing, liberating power of the gospel of Jesus in our lives, and particularly in our, in our relationship with our finances, which doesn't always feel so much like freedom. L let me just ask you a question. Don't answer out loud. And just, I'm going to ask you sort of about the typical person. You might be an exception, but let me ask you, what do you think? For the average person in general, how many hours a day over the course of our lives do you think we spend either earning or spending money? Right? I mean, it's a lot, right? It's, it's a big deal. It might be different for different people, but it's, it's a big deal. And oftentimes it exercises kind of a controlling influence over the choices we make in our lives. And because it's such a big deal, this is kind of my question or my uh, need for the gospel in this, is to ask and to say, if the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't good news for us in this area of our lives, then the gospel is missing a really big area of our lives where we need it badly. So we want to hear the good news of Jesus for us in this area of our lives also. So we're calling this series Free, right? And I want to show you something. Uh, when a, a, few we, uh, a few months ago, when we gave the vision for this series to our communications department, and we asked them to generate some different imagery that we might use for our series journals and for like sermon slides and website or stuff during this series, they gave us a few options. The one that we wound up settling on is what you see on that slide. If you got your journal, it's the one that's on the journal. But one of the other options was this one. <laughs> and uh, even as I show this to you, I'm feeling a little bit of confession and repentance. Like we totally should have used that image instead. Uh, look at these puppies up there. Isn't that awesome? Uh, if any of your dogs are represented on the slides, I'm sorry. We should pay you royalties probably later. But just look how joyful those dogs. So I put these up here mostly to acknowledge that as we talk about our relationship with money, stuff, finance in our lives, that's probably not representative of how we feel, right? Instead of just like free like this, what we often feel is trapped. Of course, money is one of the sources of significant worry, anxiety, stress in our lives. On the other hand, sometimes, which is really just the opposite side of the same coin, it can be a source of unhealthy pride in our lives. Money and our relationship with it can be and has been for probably most of us, maybe nearly all of us at some point in our lives, a source of significant conflict with 
family, with friends, if you're a married person, with your spouse, if you have kids, maybe with your kids. It's a big area of our lives where we can feel trapped. Sometimes in super practical ways, sometimes in ways that would be legitimately described as hardship, financial hardship. Maybe you have been there in life. Maybe you are there in life right now. If you are there in life right now, I want to tell you, you're not alone. There are other people who are hiding it too because that's the game we play in our world. Maybe it's where you are right now. Maybe it's where you will be at some point in the future. For me, I remember a time when Amy and I were, I was in graduate school. We lived in North Carolina. I had a grad student stipend, which is not the fast road to riches, I'll tell you that. Uh, uh, Amy had an office job at the university, and uh, we had bought our first home. It was kind of a stretch for us, not an irresponsible one, but definitely a little bit of a reach for us at a young age, uh, although in graduate school, so not all super young in life, but we had made that move, and then uh, had our first mortgage, of course, and then I remember when the, the engine in the truck that I drove to school every day, uh, when that blew, <laughs> and I was like, oh boy, that's going to be expensive, and I'm not at a place where that's good news for me, that's never good news, but especially for us, and we had bought a house that was pretty far out from the city, from Durham, North Carolina, where I was in school, because that's where we could afford something, was farther out in the country, so we were out there, and uh, man, we scraped together, and we put a remanufactured engine in my truck, and within a month, the engine in her Toyota Camry blew. <laughs> like, that's not supposed to happen, that's what can't, that's, that's a selling point, right, for those cars, right? And so now I'm like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? And I take it into the mechanic, and while it is in the shop, they back it out of the bay and lose the transmission. And like, you, do you know the Psalms in the Bible that are the how long, O oh Lord, Psalms? <laughs> I had moved on to the are you kidding me, Lord, Psalms <laughs> at that point. And I was like, I don't know the way out of this dilemma. Like all the possible escape routes that we had planned have already been used up. And it was honestly through the generosity and open-handedness of some people that kind of helped us through a tougher spot. M maybe you've been there, maybe you are there, maybe it's worse. Maybe it's coming for you in your life. We can feel trapped by these things. But the truth of the matter is, that even when things are going well in our lives, we're not always well, are we? We sometimes still feel trapped. We sometimes still feel like we're on the hamster wheel, like we can't get free, like we're chasing something that we just can't catch. And, and you guys probably know all the studies. I don't need to uh, prove all this or go to great length at the, all this. But you know that uh, after a certain point, and, and there is a point where more money in life actually is helpful. There is a point where when you don't have access to safe housing, food security, reliable health care, stable transportation, once those kinds of things are solved, every study that's ever been done on this shows that more money, more wealth, more income doesn't actually correlate with more happiness or higher quality of life. But we think it will. <laughs> we act like we think it will. Why is that? Why do we keep chasing all these things? One of my favorite little pieces of evidence in all of these studies, it's pretty granular, but I, I heard this and, and read this uh, probably, probably pushing 10 years ago now, uh, was the little piece of data that the value of our houses and the value of our cars are not statistically correlated with our happiness in life. And, and probably like at some level, we're like, yeah, I mean, I, I get that probably. And, and yet, those are some of the most common things that once we get more income or once we get more assets, that's what we poured into. We already had a good enough house. We already had safe house. It was dry, unlike my basement this week and probably yours too, whatever it is. We're like, oh, I'm gonna pour more resource into that. I'm gonna pour more resource into that. And it doesn't actually deliver any of the things that we really most value in life. We might get happier with our house or happier with our car, but if that doesn't translate into higher happiness in life, what are we really doing? Why are we doing this? Does the gospel of Jesus have any liberating, freeing, life-giving news for us in these situations. So super enlightening for me one time, when I learned, somebody shared with me, that money in our lives, of course it's not just money, right? It always stands for something else. And what somebody shared with me was an insight I found super helpful and enlightening, was that money is tied to different emotions and desires and fears for different people, and it's different for different people. So I'm going to give you a few examples, and I wouldn't be surprised if these match up or they resonate for a lot of you, but it might not be exactly the same for everybody, and you might see like, oh yeah, I get the pattern, and for me it's just a little bit different than that. But let me just give you, I'm going to give you three examples. But for some of us, money is tied to an emotion around security. Like we know that we want to have something, we know there's risk in life, and we want to guard against that risk in life, and so we think that the more that we can accumulate, the, we'll be able to eliminate threat and risk and danger in our lives. 
And this is more than just like the emergency fund you're supposed to have so that when the engine blows in your truck, you can do something about it. But, but it's more that like ongoing treadmill of if only more, then I'll be safer. And if only more, then I'll be more secure. And if this is you, you know what that temptation is like in your life and you know that it never ends. And of the temptations and tie, emotional ties, of the three I'll share with you, this is the one that is my temptation. This is the one that is uh, this temptation for me. For, for others of us, we think about our stuff maybe a little bit more in terms uh, of uh, how we are esteemed by others, what our reputation is, what are what the appearances that we give off to others. So we wonder, like, what will other people think of me based on this thing that I own, based on the clothes that I'm wearing, the overall appearance that I project, the car that's in my driveway, what will my neighbors think, the neighborhood that I live in, the trip that I can talk about when I go back to work, or kids when I go back to school. Like, all of these things say something about me, and they have some sort of relational value. And you could ask yourself, like, when I'm making a purchase or a financial decision, how much am I worried about what other people think of this? Am I getting, am I getting acceptance? Am I getting belonging? Am I giving, getting a cheap substitute for love based on these kinds of things? Or others of us might think more in terms of like enjoyment in life. Like we're almost afraid that we're missing out. We want life to be good, let's call it. And so we're chasing after things that are going to make us happy, that are going to give us some kind of satisfaction, some kind of hit. Like we already have a car, but if only if it were a different brand. Or if it not only was that brand, but it had this trim package. Or I already have a perfectly good phone in my pocket, but man, there's a new model. And, oh, and not just the new model, but the pro model. You know, like whatever. It's not like I know what I'm talking about here. Right? Um, I could get pretty detailed on this, I'm sure. And we're just afraid that we're going to miss out on some kind of happiness or satisfaction, and so we just keep chasing it. And it does, and it does actually work, like for half an hour or sometimes 24 hours. But it's like a drug, isn't it? I mean, you keep chasing that thing, and it's just diminishing returns. It never actually delivers. And that's the problem with all three of these things. It's not like it's wrong to have an emergency fund or wrong to enjoy simple things in life. But rather, it's that it keeps asking more of us and keeps delivering less, which centuries of Christian theology have said is the very characteristic of idolatry, <laughs> that this is what idols do in our lives. They keep asking us for sacrifice, to sacrifice something else and then keep delivering only diminishing returns. I don't know if you recognize yourself in one of these particular things and one of the, the contexts in which I learned this was actually a context uh, of relationship and marriage uh, conversations, because oftentimes in a relationship or with friends or extended family, or if you're a married person or if you're a parent or whatever, uh, it's tied to different things for us. We just don't realize that. And so then you think you're having a conversation about one thing, but you're having a conversation about a whole different thing. And you can't figure out why you're trapped and stuck and enslaved in this conflict and not free. It can have something to do with that. It turns out that in the reading that we read today, Go figure, Jesus was way ahead of us on this and already saw this and already diagnosed this, I think way before us and with greater insight than I know I can manage. And it shows up in the very last line of today's reading. It was this. Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and money. Now, now I want to tell you that this has been one of those things that is a, a teaching of Jesus that I have for a long time thought. This is one of those teachings of Jesus that we don't actually believe. This is one of those teachings of Jesus that we kind of disagree with, and partly, like in our heads, at some level, in theory, we're like, yeah, that's probably true, like competing allegiances, you're going to hate the one and love the other, or just love the one and despise the other. But at another level, like in our hearts and in our actions and in our attitudes, it's more like Jesus says you cannot serve both God and money, and we're like, yeah, but I think I'm going to try. <laughs> like, <laughs> but maybe other people can't, but I think maybe I can. <laughs> I'm going I'm to give it a go and see how it works out. And I think there is actually some truth to that. But it has occurred to me in recent years that our, our disbelief or our unstated disagreement with Jesus on this point actually happens a step prior to that, or if you prefer, maybe a, a layer beneath that. I think what we struggle to believe here is that our position relative to money is that we're serving it. I think we think we're freer than we actually are. I think we think we're in charge and our stuff is serving us, when to a much greater extent than we realize, we're serving it. Right? 
Jesus tells us that we are, but we believe that we're free, I think, in spite of the evidence. In spite of the way that we are driven by three or more different underlying desires and fears that we didn't freely choose. They just kind of got there by some pattern we learned when we were growing up, by some spiritual addiction to sin, by some enslavement we're there. But by the fact that we keep doing these things, even when they never actually deliver what it is that we're chasing after, and yet we keep on doing it, it's the very definition of being in bondage or in slavery to something. And Jesus says you can't serve there and serve God. But in, but in serving God, you will experience real freedom. In experiencing God, you will be set free from these different and all these other kinds of bondage and stuck and trapped and be set free instead. There's, there's an underlying truth here that I think we would do well to learn, and it's this. Freedom is not the same thing as independence. Freedom is not the same thing as I'm in charge, I'm free, I have no bounds, I serve nothing at all, I'm just the God of the universe. Because you're not. <laughs> We're not. We will always serve something. There is one creator, there is one God who is not in bondage or serving anything else, but we are creatures and we are going to serve something. The question is, what is that something doing to you? Now, I'm going to give you one more Bible passage on this and then reflect on it with you for a moment. This is also what the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans in chapter 6, in a passage that I have thought for a long, long time is really profound. So this passage starts before the verses I've got up on the screen with a hypothetical question. So if, uh, if we're under grace now, if we live in grace and there's forgiveness of sins, why not just go on sinning so that God can keep on forgiving me? Maybe you've thought this before, you've read that passage. Why not just go on with all the fun that sin promises because God will just forgive it later anyway? And Paul's answer is that not that like he doesn't say, oh, good question, but let me tell you why that doesn't work. He's like, that... That's not how that works, actually. It's not that you get free and you just sin and life is good and rich and free. You're not independent. You're going to serve something. And this is the first verse and last verse of one part of the argument there. Uh, he said, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience to God, which leads to righteousness. But now, and jump ahead a few verses, you can read the whole chapter later if you want, but now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. You're going to serve something. The question that you get to ask yourself, that we all would be wise to ask ourselves, the thing that I am actually serving in my life, is it leading me to greater joy or is it leading me to more griefs? Is it leading me to being more alive or is it just leading me to be more dead? Is it giving me greater, real, substantial freedom, or has it just got me stuck in ways that I can barely even tell? We're all serving something, and in serving God, oops, sorry, slide there, but in serving God, God sets us actually free. Think about this. We're over here in the ways that some of us are just chasing after security, thinking we can avoid every risk in life, but the gospel of Jesus says to us, that is a fool's game. You, there is no risk-free position on planet Earth in a fallen world full of sin and full of people like me. But there is one who has laid down his life for us, who has promised to care for us and take care of us and see that we are secure for all eternity, body and soul. And we don't have to chase the empty promise of security on this Earth anymore. We can chase this idol of acceptance and reputation and esteem of others all we want but even if we were to get there and we're not going to get there all we would ever get is somebody who approves of something on the outside of us and not somebody who ever loves the real us just the mask that we're putting on the outside and man we are stuck with that but we serve a god who has called us his children who has called us his beloved and says welcome to the family of god not because of who you are what you own what you look like or anything else but because of the love of god for you that will not change you can be set free from chasing this idol. We might think that we're looking for joy, happiness, pleasure, something in life, and we're just going to miss out, and life's not going to be good if we don't get the newest, latest, most whatever. But God has given us the promise of the joy of life in his presence, life in his love, life together with his people, where we experience peace and contentment that cannot be taken away from us. There's a verse that in the book of Philippians in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul testifies, I've learned the secret of being content in all circumstances, 
whether in plenty or in want. Have you learned that secret yet? Most of us have not learned that secret yet, but there is contentment and joy in all circumstances. This is what the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us, that nothing else in this world can. When I talk about the freedom that's present for us in the gospel, it, could I get you to open your uh, the series journals? If you don't have one, <laughs> if you don't have one, just grab one on the way out. But I, just turn to page two in your series journal. I've kind of put this in slightly different words on the screen up here. You can just look up there if you don't have a journal. But I want you to see here on page two, there's three bullet points there at the bottom of the page. The freedom that we're going to be learning about in this series, the freedom that God gives us, I think comes in at least these three ways. We get internal freedom. We get peace and joy in our souls and in our hearts in place of stress and anxiety and worry. Let me tell you something. I want that for me. I want that for you. I want that for us. I know that I'm a different person. I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. I'm a better friend. I'm a better neighbor. I'm a better pastor when I'm living from an internal sense of peace and joy and not driven by my own anxiety and worry. This is the freedom that comes to us in Christ. We also get the freedom, uh, I'm calling it here on the screen, non-obedience to the crazy. <laughs> we don't have to keep chasing. We don't have to keep doing things that don't help us and actually in the long run probably hurt us. In the journal it says non-obedience to a slave master. We're set free. We are also set free for good. We're set free for goodness and joy, and I mean that sense of for good in both of the ways that we can use that phrase. We're set free to do good. We're set free to be kind and open-handed and generous and fair and just and concerned for others. We're set free to be opened up in love toward our neighbor and not turned in on ourselves, always concerned about ourselves. We're set free for good, and we're set free for good forever to live now in relationship with God, in the kind of relationship with God that he gives us by his grace and power forever. This is the kind of freedom that comes to us in the gospel of Christ to set us free from the various ways that we are stuck. Can I just give you a little preview of, of what's coming here in the next few weeks? And you, use your journal. If you don't have it, again, grab one on the way out. But if you were to turn another couple of pages forward, you'll see it's page, I guess, page four. There's a few bullet-pointed questions that this whole freedom is given to us in the Holy Spirit of God. It doesn't depend on us getting smarter. It's not a new money management plan. It's not about your asset allocations. What we actually need is an encounter with the guiding, empowering presence of God in our lives who can set us free and lead us. And there's some questions here that I want to invite you. You might just want to do this on your own. At some point, if you're in a small group, you want to talk about your small group, or if you're married to your spouse or with some trusted friends, these are just some reflection questions that I'd encourage you to ask God to help you think about and reflect on in your own life. And then having done that, you can turn, and there's a few key passages that we're going to return to, core teachings in the New Testament in particular, about our relationship with our stuff and our money that are liberating and challenging and empowering. And then when you get past those, there are some, a few places where you can journal your answers to some reflection questions on those passages. Just do that over the course of the series. I think God will lead you into truth and freedom and power in your life. And then over the course of the series, what we're going to do is we're going to hear the gospel for us in all the different roles we play in life. The gospel for us as savers. We're all saving and storing up something. We began to hear that in today's passage. The gospel for us is debtors. The gospel for us is givers. The gospel for us in all these different ways. Uh, the gospel for us is spenders. We all spend something. To hear the good news of Jesus set us free in all these different capacities in which we live. And I also just quickly want to point out to you that already starting this afternoon in our education hour, if you haven't signed up yet, it's not too late, we're running some practical classes because in our sermons on Sunday morning, we're going to come into a liberating encounter with the good news of Jesus and the presence of his Holy Spirit. And you make it to the point you, where God is doing that internal work on you and you'd like some help with just some best practices, some wisdom, some helpful practical teaching. So we've got classes in our education hour on Sunday afternoons. There's details in the ministry guide, and Pastor Joe's going to share some things at the end of the service. But those are places where uh, we've got two classes running for the next two weeks, and there's two more classes on, like, budgeting and giving and debt and legacy planning uh, that are happening over the course of this month and into the first week of May. If you want some help with those, I think those will be really fruitful. I would encourage you to participate in that. Let me land here, and uh, uh, it might be kind of a weird place to land, but can I show you this picture again for a second? Um, I, I'm laughing at myself once because, I mean, a number of years ago, I remember watching this video that some church leaders made to make fun of themselves, and one of the things they made fun of was when the pastor puts pictures of puppy on the screen to manipulate the audience. 
And uh, I am now a meme of myself, which I just think is kind of hilarious. Um, but here, I want you to notice something about this dog, and the other ones I put up earlier are all the same. Uh, this dog right here is not feral. <laughs> this, this dog is not independent, it's free. You might even notice it has a collar on. There's a little, uh, little tag over there. Uh, this dog is not independent or feral. It's not snarling. It's not worried. It's not snapping at you when you try to get near its food. <coughs> this dog is open and free. It is dependent. It is dependent, not independent. It is dependent on a master who loves it and provides for it. Anybody get where I'm going with this? You see where I'm going, right? It is, it is probably, it is not independent, it is dependent. It is also probably interdependent. It is playing at the dog park with other dogs in joy and sharing its toys and, and all that sort of thing. I, I think, now, I don't mean to say that you're a dog, uh, and I, I'm, I'm not a dog. Uh, although if you're a when Harry Met Sally fan, anybody know the old movie? Somebody, no? Okay, all right. Uh, uh, what we're seeing here, though, I think is a, a picture. It's a picture that can be useful to us of freedom and joy that comes in faith in the God who loves us and cares for us and provides us and saves us and directs us and gives us a, a place to live and to flourish in this world. God grants us freedom and joy in relationship with him. So I want to uh, close this time of reflection on God's word in prayer, praying for God to do this work in me, in you, and in us together. And, and I hope that you will lean in on this series in the coming weeks, I think, that the gospel of Jesus and his Holy Spirit can do real work, can grow real fruit in all of our lives, and give you more freedom and more joy in a really difficult area of our lives than we ever experience without him. So let, let's, let's pray for God to do that work in us. Good and gracious God, you, you love us more than we deserve. And we come before you in gratitude for all the good gifts that you have given us in life. And we confess that we, that we, are, we are foolish and we run from you and we most of the time, don't even believe you when you teach us about these things. But I pray that you would be our teacher and that you would free us from the fears and desires and longings that we're not even sometimes aware of, but that do bind us and trap us. Pray that you would root your good news, your liberating, powerful, freeing good news in our hearts and, and in our homes and in our relationships and in our communities. We depend on you. Pray that you would do your good work in us and, and give us the courage and the power to follow wherever you lead. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for our hymn.
For centuries, believers around the world have confessed their faith through the Apostles' Creed. So together we confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. We're going to move into a dedicated time of prayer. I'd invite you to kneel if you are able. Otherwise, please be seated. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Sharon Thomas recovering at home and a portion of our members with ongoing health needs. Judy Backoff, Sandra Boyd, Louise Brower, Keith Brown, John Burkhart, Jaya Fever, Bob Gebhardt, Brandon Guthrie, Mark Nandor, and Dar Darlene Rankin. And Father, we pray for Dan Hill at the death of his mother, for Sally Watkins at the death of her father, for Tammy Schuster as she waits for her father to pass, and for all families who have lost loved ones. And we rejoice, Lord, at Andrew and Maggie Heath at the birth of their daughter, Norma Eigel Heath, grandparents of Marty and Lisa Eigel. And we celebrate Jennifer Gossard and Andy Black's wedding yesterday. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those of us who are struggling with mental illness or emotional pain and suffering. Father, we pray that you would strengthen us, give us wisdom for life, and help us to grow in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you that we are not alone in proclaiming your good news to this community and around the world. So today we pray for the following area churches. The Hispanic Church of Columbus. Rock City Church, Veritas Community Church, and Dwell Community Church. And we pray for our mission partner, International Friendships, or IFI. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for leaders at every level of government. We ask for wisdom, humility, and the pursuit of your common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for our neighbors in our neighborhoods. Help us to be conduits to them. Help bridges to you of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for this church, for UALC. We pray for Pastor Steve, the staff, and council. And we pray for us, Lord, that we, you might remind us the call to love and serve others. Help us, Lord, to love each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, now as we move into a time of confession, our hearts are open to you. We are aware that you know all of our desires and that no secrets are hidden from you. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. I invite you now into a time of silent reflection as we prepare for public confession. <clears throat> Most merciful God, we confess that without Christ, we are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. 
we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Now receive this good news. To all who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become children of God and bestows upon them his Holy Spirit. In his mercy, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us our sins. So by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I would ask that you would stand. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please greet one another with God's peace. If I could, if I could invite you please to return to your seats and you can wave and say hello to the people at home. God's peace be with all of you also as you are returning to your seats. We, uh, I, uh, we're going to prepare to give our offerings. This is also a great time if you didn't get to pass the Know Your Rope at the beginning of the service, you can please do that right now. Uh, Whenever we give our tithes and offerings in worship, you've heard Pastor Joe and me say before, it's always two things. It's always an act of worship by, whereby we honor God and even train our hearts to put God first. It's also a practical act of generosity. We participate in the mission of Jesus here in our church. Uh, as offering is something that we do as worship together, let's join our voices together uh, in our offering prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Care and redemption. Care and redemption. Whether you do your giving online, electronically, or here in the baskets on Sunday morning, Take this opportunity as a time, a prayerful time of worship to give thanks to God for his good gifts and to dedicate our lives to the care and redeeming work that God does in our world. I invite the ushers, please, to come forward.
Please be seated. Real freedom begins here with Jesus Christ. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples to eat. And he said, take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In a like manner, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he gave it to all of them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Would you join me as we pray the prayer that our Lord gave his disciples? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In just a few moments, the ushers will come forward, and they will release you pew by pew, starting at the front and ushering you through the center aisle. We will have four stations up front. Please take, go to whichever station is open. You're allowed to linger, or I would invite you to linger on the sides as you receive your elements, and then go back to your pews. We also have a prayer team in the back. Please take advantage of that as you need to. If you need gluten-free or, or bread or grape juice, please ask for it. It'd be our privilege to give that to you. And if you cannot come forward, um, I'll be bringing communion out into the congregation. Please wave at me, let me know, nod at me, wink at me, whatever you need to do to get my attention, and I will bring communion to you right where you are. I'm going to have the communion servers come up first. We will serve them. And then please come, for all is ready.
for those of you who are worshiping with us online and at home, thank you for being here. If you would take a piece of bread and you would break it off and hand it to one another, the body of Christ given for you. If you would now take the cup and you would pass it to each other, and if you're home alone, hear these words from this family to you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being family and being connected. If you're a visitor or a guest, we have a gift for you back in the coffee station. Please don't hesitate to ask for that. It's there for you. You'll see a new slide that we've put up. We're going to try to condense our announcements so we spend more time in worship and less time on announcements. So you'll see these slides. Um, if there's time at times, I will go through them with you and for you. Otherwise, you'll see the slide. You know most of this stuff, and so please take advantage of that, and we won't reiterate it. I do have another announcement, though, that I would like you to, uh, to see, and that is the adult education hour to this starts today. There are two, two classes each time. And so um, starting on the, today, the 7th and the 14th, um, building a budget or a planning, planned giving. And then two new classes starting on the 28th and May 5th, managing debt and joyful generosity. So both class, all four classes are two sessions. You'll figure it out. Sign up and come. <laughs> Just, it's that simple. Just sign up and come and you'll figure it out. It's worth it. Um, there's, there already has been good stories of the adult education having an impact in our congregation as we have uh, begun to offer those. Sunday school will happen over in Windermere. You can take the bus over to that. Thanks for joining us today again. Josh, if you'd come forward, we'll sing our last hymn together. <laughs> My dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the risen Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.